Hi there, Shannon Tipton, and we are getting ready to head into our next Learn Something New session with Diane Elkins, co-owner of Artisan eLearning. However, in true Learning Rebel style, I forgot to hit the record button when we started our session. But don't worry, we hit the record button right after introductions and just before she started her session on the eight things that you can start doing tomorrow to make your learning programs more accessible. So here's a quick intro. As I stated, Diane is the co-owner of Artisan eLearning and has been working in the accessibility space since 2009. Now I've known Diane for a number of years and there is no better subject matter expert on this topic than her. So she is here and is going to share her evidence-based practices and knowledge so she can help us help others get the learning people deserve to be successful in their work. So without further ado, over to Diane. See some other things coming in um, chat here about great experiences for everybody. Uh, how to make them fun and accessible. Yes, accessible. Um, courses are often have a bad reputation for being boring and ugly. So that gets to my next question. What's there? Why not? Now, who's who's there? I'm not saying what's your why not. And maybe you have a why not. But especially out there, there are people that you may encounter who will think, well, you don't really need to do this because. And we just heard one. Accessible courses are boring and ugly. That's a why not for some people. That's why we're not doing it. Um, I just heard time as a potential concern. Yep, it's it's legit. I'm not going to pretend it's not going to be more work to make this happen. Um, it's more work to do good instructional design. I mean, a lousy course is the easiest thing to build, right? Good. What else? Diane. What are some of the what are some of the why nots you hear? Diane, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to call the elephant in the room. A big portion of the why not is that those that are usually in power and our decision makers are usually not those that have had barriers to their ability of being able to succeed. Exactly. And so they don't think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. Good. So some people think we don't need it at all. Yeah. So some of the most common arguments I hear would be things like, um, nobody with a disability could do this job. Have you ever come across that? Yep. Okay, I'd, I'd like to time. take, <laughs> I'd like to ask for a volunteer who has relatively good vision and glasses are okay. And I'd like, um, I have got about four questions to ask you. Would anybody like to uh, volunteer? Somebody with relatively good vision. Okay, thank you. And that is, I'm sorry, I can't, it's not showing me your name. Erica. Erica. It's Erica. Okay. I don't know okay. why. That's so sad. That's okay, Erica, thank you for volunteering. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Can you tell me what this is? I believe those are two loaves of baked bread. Yes. So that is a blurry image of two loaves of bread. And it's not some fancy ocular degenerate, macular degeneration filter. It's just the blur filter in PowerPoint. Okay, so yes, that is two loaves of bread. Um, next, how about this one? I'm gonna go with bananas, bananas, but that's a banana's picture, so. Yes, yes, you are absolutely right. That is a similarly blurry um, picture of bananas. So would you say, Erica, that if, let's say this was your level of vision. Right. Do you think perhaps with a little bit of um, accommodation and a little bit of specialized training and partnership with your cashier, do you think this level, with this level of vision, you would be able to bag groceries in a way that you didn't put these bananas on top of that bread and switch it? Do you think you could do that with this level of vision? I think yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that seems reasonable. In fact, I would even argue you wouldn't need this level of vision. Probably, probably not. Even, uh, you probably don't need any vision because you'd be relying on um, tactile. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Exactly. What it feels again, like. With a little bit of help um, in how to navigate the systems and some support from the cashier about a few things. Absolutely. Okay. So this is your level of vision. We determine that, yes, 
you are able to be a cashier. So can you please <laughs> take my e-learning course? <laughs> I would I would love to, Diane. <laughs> yeah. I have some challenges in front of me. Yes. Yeah, so here we yeah. have a um, an e-learning course with the same blur filter. This is the same amount of blur as the bread and the bananas. Yeah, so stupendous. you could do your job. You just couldn't take the training. The e -learning. Yep. Yeah. This is a fantastic point. Thanks. We need Very to be well careful done. that we don't make assumptions about what people can and can't accomplish in their lives. I don't believe it is my job as an instructional designer to say what somebody can and cannot accomplish. So when any, any, whenever anybody says, well, somebody with a disability couldn't do this job, I think you need to be careful about making those assumptions about people. Um, and if they can't do the job, ask yourself why. Are there barriers that can be removed? Oh yeah, you can do the job. You just couldn't get through our hiring system, our HR system, our orientation, our online application process, our benefits process, our timekeeping. Yeah, you could do the job. You could do the work. You just couldn't do the job because none of our systems are accessible. And that's another reason why we don't have sometimes people in our organization. So if we say nobody, um, uh, you know, nobody with an accessibility or with a disability can do this job, I think we need to ask ourselves, says who? Well, Diana, just hearing you list that, what I'm also thinking too is that, <clears throat> oh no, I just lost my thought. Um, what we're saying, I, I think then there's also a need to unpack the statement of somebody with a barrier cannot do this job. And if the data that is presented to us is that well, they can't use the on uh, the online HRIS, or they can't do this e-learning course. That those are these are two different things that we have to talk about. Then we have to talk about right the ability and the accessibility of the tools with which we provide people that may not even be training focused to not use that as a corollary to say that then therefore this person cannot do this job. Right. So all the support services that are needed for somebody to do their job like HR systems and such. But then also, have we built the job around the assumption of a certain set of, of abilities? And that is our entire operating, and that's the definition of being ableist. I don't know if you've heard that term. Ableist means the default assumption is the traditional set of abilities. And most jobs are centered around that. And yet with a little bit of creativity, many jobs could be changed if they needed to. So nobody with a disability could do this job is one of the big why nots. And then another one is we don't have anybody with a disability in our organization or in this job. Okay, well, we're going to play a game. Have you ever heard the game Two Truths and a Lie? Yeah, where you say it's a networking game where you say three things about yourself, two are true, one's a lie, and the other person has to guess. I'm going to do uh, two truths and a couple of lies about me, myself. Okay, you ready? Number one. I have tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. Number two, I have dyslexia. Number three, I am colorblind. Number four, I have limited feeling in my fingertips because of cancer treatments when I was a child. And I have frozen shoulder and have limited mobility in my right arm. Two of those things are true. Do you know which ones? It's a rhetorical question because you don't, unless you, some one of you watched If You Ask Betty, in which case you know the answer to that question. And I'm not gonna tell you the answer to that question. Some of my coworkers don't know the answer to that question. People do not need to self-reveal and not all disabilities are visible. So I just uh, read off five things that you wouldn't necessarily know about me and all five of them could impact how I interact with a new learning course. So we don't have anybody in our organization with a disability. Yeah, you do. And I think we can all think of reasons why somebody may choose not to self-identify. So <clears throat> we need to just set that aside. Do you have people in your organization with disabilities? Yes. So, that brings me to <laughs> the first <laughs> of the eight tips. And that is uh, things you can do tomorrow. Again, 
tomorrow. Like you don't need to know anything. Number one, use good color contrast. You have colorblind people in your organization, period. If you have at least, I forget, uh, eight people, you're likely to have somebody who's colorblind. The, it varies in different demographics. The, the demographic with the highest um, prevalence of color con, of uh, colorblindness is U.S. male Caucasian, 8%. 8% of the population is colorblind to some degree. It's more common in men than women. So this is something you can do starting tomorrow. Use good color con. Just say to yourself, I am never going to create another document, another logo, another slide. I'm just not going to do I'm drawing a line in the sand today, moving forward, that I'm going to use good color contrast. So what constitutes color contrast? Well, this is an example of a slide where we've got teal on white and gray on white. And this is a very common design aesthetic right now. Orange on white, uh, yellow on white even, aqua on white, teal on white. Very, very common. And yeah, maybe that's your design aesthetic, but is it, you know, are you adding that if? You can take my training if your eyeballs work with my design aesthetic. Versus, here's the after. It's a slightly darker teal. It's a slightly darker gray. Like, oh my gosh, the world's going to end. You use darker teal. Okay, now I realize that there is marketing police and they have real power and they like to yield, wield their power. So I'm not saying you have to abandon your color palette because I don't wanna wish that fight on anybody. So here's what you need to know about color contrast. Color contrast does not keep you from using any color. Color contrast is about combinations of color. So if this lighter teal is part of your palette, you can use it, just don't put white text on it. Or don't put it on white text. You can still use it for, you know, a drop shadow on a photo or a stripe at the top of whatever, or use it with black or dark, dark gray. So you can still use any color you want. Contrast is about pairings of colors. So you don't even have to take on the marketing department. So how do you test? How do you check? Well, one of my favorite tools is the Web Aim Contrast Checker. So let me pull it up right here. So this is a website and I will put the link here in chat. And here's what you do. The reason I love this site is you don't even have to remember what the rules are because it tells you what the rules are. So let's say, um, I forgot to ask you in advance if I could do this, uh, Shannon. I'm gonna pull up Shannon's website. Uh, I thought I still had it. Hang on, let me pull up the, the announcement for this page, uh, for this exact. Okay, so here we go. Look, teal on white. How are we doing? So here's how this contrast checker works. So I'm going to put the website on one side and the color checker on the other side. So what you do is there's a foreground and a background color. So I'm going to start off. Oh, apparently when I made it smaller, the graphic got different. There we go. Okay, so let's try this purple on white first. So what you do is you click right here in the swatch. There's a little eyedropper. There's the, my uh, background. It doesn't matter if you do foreground or background, they're interchangeable. And my background is white. And what it's gonna tell me is that combination passes for normal and large text. So nice job. Now, there's some terms here that you may not be familiar with. WCAG is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That is the international standard for how to make something accessible. And there are different levels Double A is what most people shoot for. So this passes for normal text for double A and large text. So we're good. Now I already know that yellow on black works. So I'm not gonna test that one, but this teal here, mm, that one's a little iffy. So let's try that one. Okay, it passes for large text, but not for small text. So this is pretty big, but the learning rebels, that's gonna be hard for some people to see, but for the big text, that's okay. Now, what about this yellow on the teal? So some people won't be able to read that, okay? So thank you for um, not stopping me from doing that, Shannon. I would say thanks for letting me, but you didn't let me, I just did it. Um, but it's, it's, I don't do it to pick on Shannon. It's, it's about, this is, this is about moving forward. This is I not am. about looking back. It's about the next thing you create. Yes. To, to be fair though, to, to Shannon, would we have to flip 
our hex colors for foreground and background, considering that the background is the teal and the foreground is the yellow? It's the same either way. Oh, it, it is. Matter. Yep. Oh. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank yep. you. And you just showed me two new things that I didn't know that I could use on the tool. So yay. Good. Thanks, um, Erica, though. I appreciate the effort. <laughs> now you also want to use, um, you have to use your judgment to a certain extent because, you know, even if maybe this was a little bit darker, it still might not be easy to read. Um, future standards are going to make more of a distinction between light and uh, foreground versus background because there is a difference. Um, white on royal blue is going to be harder to read than royal blue on white. So that is not currently reflected in the standards. That's why I don't really care about which one. Okay, so that is a tool you can start using tomorrow and just commit to yourself when I make infographics, PowerPoint slides, I am going to use combinations that work. Okay, number two, add closed captions. It is not hard or expensive anymore to add closed captions to something. So if you are in Articulate Storyline, you can add them right there directly in the tool. You can also pay somebody and import them. You can use automated tools. Uh, if you're gonna use an automated tool, be sure to do a human check. Automated tools are usually between 80 and 90% effective or uh, accurate. And you might go, oh, that's close enough, but ask yourself if you're okay with your scripts being 80% accurate. Is there any other aspect of your content where 80% accurate is okay? So just realize that for some people, the captions is how they learn. So yeah, Premiere Pro does it. Um, a lot of people use a tool called rev.com. Uh, at Artisan eLearning, we use a company called 3Play Media, where it's a combination of automatic and human reviewed. You upload your script, you upload your audio file, they send you a closed caption file, you write a check. <coughs> <coughs> so it's not hard, it is not expensive, you don't need to get stakeholder buy-in, just start doing it. And then if you're, um, you know, if you're using virtual platforms, most virtual platforms have closed captioning now, automated closed captioning. And yes, it's not perfect, but it is, it is better than nothing. And what you, one thing you may or may not know about PowerPoint is that even PowerPoint now has captioning. So here I have my, um, let me pull my cheat view here. And let me exit out of this and go to slideshow. I don't usually turn this on on a webinar because the webinar platform has tools. Subtitles. Okay, let's go back in. Let's give it a minute. Hang on. So now it is about to start. And now it is automatically adding closed captions for anything I say. So if I'm at a conference, if I'm teaching in the classroom, I have to check one little box and I have automated closed captions. So, and the tools are only getting better. So just make a commitment. You put a video on YouTube, you put a video on your um, website, you make a storyline or a Captivate or a Rise course, add your closed caption does not take a lot of time or a lot of money. For the closed captions that are happening in real time in PowerPoint, mm -hmm. have you noticed um, their accuracy is a really strong or is there anything that you need to do to change your cadence if you are presenting to assure that the captions will uh, capture correctly? Um, it does a decent job. It is not perfect. You know, the gold standard is a live human, and we're talking about things that are easier to do. Um, the main thing I would say is, uh, and this is good to do anyway, is if you've got audience interaction, the captions usually can even pick up room noise, not just you standing right at your computer, but you might want to repeat what the person says, which is a good thing to do anyway. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to closed captions. Okay, so that was number two. Number three, make your buttons bigger. That is such an easy thing to do. Doesn't cost you any money. Uh, I, I said I wasn't going to tell you about my two truths and a lie. I will tell you about one of them, as I do have frozen shoulder. So right now, I can lift my arm sideways. Can you see it? Can you see me lift my arm sideways? No, you can't. Well, I'm at about, what, 35 degrees? Yeah. It's way better now, but for a while, I could 
barely use my arm for a full day with my mouse. And so I had to use my non-dominant hand. So that's an example of what's considered a temporary disability. So especially when you say people with a disability couldn't do this job, um, there's nobody in my organization with a disability. Disabilities are full, they're partial, they're permanent, they're temporary, they're progressive. So I would have hated to have been fired because I have a six month stint of a bad shoulder and I have to use my non-dominant hand. And there are some software that I had to use where like I'm on track to hit the button I want and then at the last minute my hand shakes and I hit a different button because they were so small and so close together. And I would cancel out of something I didn't mean to cancel. And imagine if somebody's taking a test, they're taking your test. So, you know, I could do something with smaller buttons or I can do something with larger buttons that anybody can click. There are a number of reasons why someone may not be precise with a mouse. And I'd hate to say you can't get better at your job because of it. So, I have a question you. about that. What about the player? Because I don't think you can change the size of the buttons in the player. <laughs> um, so things like storyline or captivate players, um, mm -hmm. they, they do meet best practices. Okay. So the, um, Oh, I forget the pixel count. Um, there's no formal standard right now for a size. Um, so I mentioned uh, WCAG is the, the international standard, AA, and they are currently in version uh, 2.1. They're about to release 2.2, like any day, but they've also been saying that for a year and a half. And in 2.2, there is a specific recommendation for how big the button will be. Now, one of the things, I'm a primarily a storyline person. One of the things I highly recommend in Storyline is the default next and back buttons are just um, the little arrow, just like the little greater than, less than sign, and the submit button is just a check mark. That makes them very small, very hard to read. I always recommend going into the player settings and doing icon plus text. That right there makes the button bigger. And it also makes it clearer for people who might have information processing challenges. You know, you're on a question and all you see is a little check mark at the bottom. I don't think that's clear that that's a submit button. You have the word submit next to it. There's no question that that's your submit button. So that's one thing that'll make your buttons a little bit bigger. Yeah. I wish they had turned on the um, text by default, but they did not. <laughs> Diane, in the suggestion that you just made about the um, uh, icon plus text, is that the same as changing the player um, the player sizing, because like I just uh, noticed that somebody helped me out with that and recommended to go up to 150 for mm -hmm. the player, um, which helps to increase like you the native next and forward. But do you mm -hmm. still feel that that is insufficient? So let me show it for those of you who aren't familiar with what we're talking. How many of you um, are Storyline users? So it's like a <laughs> Looks like a lot of <coughs> you are. Here's the uh, course I sometimes use for my 508 training. Let me pull that up and I will show you. So in the player dialog box, uh, so the default is just this, these little arrows here, but if I go <coughs> to colors and effects, I can say icon and text. Now I have the words, they're automatically bigger. And then you can also change the font on the player. So if I were to make this bigger, it does make everything a little bit bigger in relation to the slide. So that's something that you can change both the um, percentage of the color and the player font. So let me try that again. I'm going to go down to 100, but not hit enter. You see how everything just got a little bit smaller. So you can control it to a certain extent. Yes, thank you. But I, and I believe in adding the words also for the information processing benefits. I think everybody wins when it's clearer where to click. Okay, so number three is make your buttons bigger. Number four, stop using sense-based language. So, but RQM Financial is not just about saving money, it's about helping individuals and families achieve their goal. Click the speaker icons below each family to listen to their stories. Which words there assume that the learner has a certain sense? that they may or may not have. What do you think? Yeah, the word click assumes they're using a mouse. Listen assumes they can hear. How about the word below? 
below is a visual term. You know, if I say, um, click the button to the right of something, right is a purely visual term, more so than below. And below, at least, you know, if I'm using a screen reader, and if you're not familiar with that term, if I can't see or can't see well, I can have a software on my computer that reads to me what's happening. And so it's going to read it in an order. And so if something comes later than something else, I'd probably go, yeah, I think that's what they mean by below. But how would I know? But right? Like there's no sense of right or left. It's a visual convention. So we can be more inclusive with our language. So if it just says select each of the play buttons to learn about several family stories. Now notice I also said play instead of speaker icon. Play button, having, having a button where it's very clear what it is and what it means is gonna help everybody. So it's, it's um, once you start paying attention to this, it's fascinating how much sense-based language you use. Well, as you can see, you know, it just there's just so many ways we use that. And <clears throat> I've read some posts on LinkedIn about, is it okay to say that? You know, hey, see what happens. And a lot of folks with disabilities say, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. I, I know what you mean. I'm not offended. But what about that one person who might be? Like, is it really necessary to use that word? Can we use a different word? So at a minimum, don't use sense-based language if it's for instructions. And then if you can avoid using them in more um, just transactional language that it's not about a specific instruction. But hear, see, look. Now you also want to consider the sense base, um, the senses used in any of your actual content. So if you are teaching a sense based skill, that's different. If I'm teaching you CPR and it involves your hands and it involves listening for breath sounds, that's a little different. And I would encourage you to have conversations about what would this mean for someone who has a disability? Because if if I am deaf and I am near somebody who collapses, I want to be able to save their life. Help me save their life. So you might actually want to even change how you teach a skill if that skill involves a certain sense. But here I'm just talking about wording choices. There's, there's, there's no sense-based skill in this content. And yes, I, and yet I can be using language. So again, this is something you can just start doing tomorrow. Number five, allow enough time. So I might have a learning disability, reading disability. Um, English might not be, I might not be fully fluent. Um, I might be slow because of a tremor or because of pain that I have. Uh, if I'm using a screen reader, it's going to take me longer to go through the content than it's going to take somebody else. So never decide for a student how long it takes to consume your content. And in courses and with tools like Storyline, here are the two main ways that comes up. One is a quiz timer. <clears throat> whether it's the formal quiz timer or whether it's a game that has a timer feature, realize you are deciding for someone else how long it will take them to read, understand, and process it. So unless there is a very clear job-specific reason, just don't do it. Just don't do it. Now, there could be a job specific reason. Let's say that I'm doing a course on terminology for air traffic controllers. And I'm in the tower one day and I'm like, oh, two planes about to collide. I know this one. Oh, what is it? What is it? What is it? I know it. It's on the tip of my tongue, right? Like, you better know that cold. So I'm going to give you a time test. There's a very specific job related purpose. But for most of our content, there's not. Now, in gamification, a quiz, a, a, a countdown feature, a time, or something like that can add a lot of fun. Just realize that it's exclusionary as well, and you need to decide, is that extra bit of fun worth the barrier you've put in? And or, can you have a way to turn off that feature? Yes, Erica. Diane, does this also at all um, impact us? like when we've been suggested a best practice is inside of an LMS to try and indicate, you know, how long a particular piece of learning content might take. I, it's not um, 
perhaps timed the actual course, but we try to say, oh, we, you know, we took it and it averaged, you know, mm -hmm. up to an hour. Does that create any um, accessibility concerns from your experience? And do you have a suggestion for how to manage that? I would say it only creates an accessibility concern if you're not letting people take longer than that. So for you to say, this course takes most people one hour to complete. That's expectation setting. There's nothing wrong with that. But then also don't judge them for it. Oh, wow, it took this person an hour and a half. I don't know anybody who's looking at that data. And normally you're concerned about the other way. <laughs> this is an hour course and you finished it in 12 minutes. I think we have a problem. But letting people know what to expect, I think, is fine. And then the other big way that this comes in is auto advancing slides. If you auto advance your slide, you are telling somebody, I pick how long you need to be on this content. So don't do it. Let them stay. And yes, they could back up. Yes, they can go, but it's just extra work. It's just so does work. that mean that you would use a next? I mean, obviously there's an X button on the player, but would you use a cue to tell them when to click next or would you just let them figure it out? That's a, that's a big debate. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a huge fan of um, putting in the instructions, putting in instructions on every slide because I think it feels repetitive. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if there's audio, I always include the seek bar so that people can tell when um, the, the slide is over because sometimes you might have a little pause in the audio and people don't know it's over yet. So I think the seek bar helps with that as well. But I don't usually say add to the audio click next to continue or anything like that. Okay. So Diane, that opens up a question for me and possibly a can of worms that isn't appropriate for today <laughs> when, because that's into the whole don't hold your learners hostage mentality, which has come about because of the whole button seat concern, because a regulatory agency is saying, mm -hmm. you know, your learners need to have X amount of hours in mm -hmm. learning. If, if you don't have a regulatory need to have a learning take X amount of time, then um, am I hearing you well that we should try to then unlock the course to make sure that people can self-navigate? Again, the, the difference is, are we trying to, is I want to give them enough time. Right. Locking it down is the reverse. I don't want you to finish quicker. So Correct. keeping somebody from finishing quicker, in my opinion, is not an accessibility concern. It's an accessibility concern if you're preventing them from taking longer than they want. Now, should you lock down your course? That's a whole different bag of worms. I think it right. does make it a little harder for accessibility. I will give you, I'll give you my 45 second soapbox on the subject. E-learning has turned our industry into control freaks in a way that we don't do in the classroom. Well, how will I know they do it? How will I know they got it right? How will I know they finished it? How will I know they listen to it? And some people lock down their courses. Adult learning theory says adults like to have control over their learning. At the same time, I'm an adult and I'd like to have control over lots of things I don't get to have control over. So if you don't lock down a course, some people will skip some of the content. You're either okay with it or you're not. And so you need to factor in the impact of that information and the ability of your learner to make a good choice. So if I am teaching a 16-year-old bagger how to clean up a spill safely, that bagger does not get to choose. That bagger does not have the skill set to choose. I'm locking that down. And I'm locking plenty of things down. So I am more pro lockdown than a lot of people in the industry. I am not a purist because I know that not everybody will make a good decision. So to me, that's the question. If you don't lock it, some people will skip it. You're either okay with that or you're not. Now, I did have one client who said, oh, we're not going to lock down this compliance course. And I'm like, really? And they said, if we tell them to take it and they don't, then we have a culture mismatch and we address that. I'm like, oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. So again, it's making sure they create, spend a minimum amount of time I don't believe has an accessibility concern. Keeping them from taking as long as they need, that's the accessibility concern. Okay. I appreciate that's that distinction. Thank you. You bet. And yes, Heather, having a way to play or pause replay is really helpful. One of the things that Storyline did about a year ago was added keyboard shortcuts. 
for the learner, which is fantastic. The, and I, they got 90% there. It would have been phenomenal if they had done something to let the learner automatically be able to figure out what the shortcuts are. And it doesn't. So we have to tell the students what the shortcuts are. But especially if you have a disability, the, uh, what is it? Control Alt greater than is next. Control Alt P is pause. Control Alt M is mute. If you have a disability, that is so freaking helpful. Let your learners know about those tools. That's something you can do tomorrow. There's tip number nine. Let your learners know about the shortcuts that are already built in. You don't have to lift a finger for those shortcuts to work. They're awesome. Okay, number six, use inclusive imagery. So you probably have had conversations in your organizations about diversity and images, and you're thinking about things like age and race and <coughs> um, identity and ethnicity and hopefully you're doing all of that. And disability needs to be a part of that conversation as well. People want to be a part of the experience. They want to, I used to say they want to see themselves in courses, but not everybody would see themselves in a course. Now, this is not necessarily an easy thing to do on the surface, but I'm only giving you easy things, but you do have to do something a little bit of extra. So let's say that I go to Getty Images, which is what we use at Artisan. And I do a search for a business meeting. And then I scroll through the results and it's like, it's shiny, happy people. Like this is ableism 101 on full display. Oh, look, there's somebody with a, a wheelchair. One person <coughs> <coughs> and all of that. So does that mean they don't have a diverse image set? No, it just means that it's not the default presentation. All I have to do is add the word disability. And I get a completely different set of images. Now, granted, almost all of them are wheelchair. And so you can end up overrepresenting there. So all you then have to do <laughs> is <coughs> add negative wheelchair. Now we've got somebody with Down syndrome. We've got an arm brace. We've got a prosthetic leg. We've got somebody with a hearing aid. Like you have got such a rich spectrum of ability. There's somebody uh, using sign language. All of those images were there, but they don't come up in the default search. Yes, Adobe Stop. The one thing you'll have to check is how to do a negative search. That is different in, in um, Getty, you just type negative whatever. In others, there's a panel on the side where you indicate what words to exclude, but most platforms have an exclusion search option. So what's one thing you can do tomorrow? Two words completely changed my search results. <laughs> Number seven, make your text readable. Unless your job is to create fine art, the job of text is to be read. And anything that you do that keeps that from happening is going to be a barrier to learning more for some than for others. So I, um, my uh, degrees in graphic design, and I took a whole class in typography and I loved it. Uh, and one of the mantras was never sacrifice legibility for creativity. But you can't use an ableist approach to what's legible and what's not. Not everybody has your ability to read, not everybody has your eyesight. So here are a couple of things that you wanna watch out for. Watch out for text that's too small especially for those of you with good vision, and I'm gonna be ageist for a minute, those of you who are younger, okay? So watch out for text that is too small. There is no official standard for how big your text should be. So you're gonna to have to use a common sense test. Too funky. Uh, one of the mantras that I learned is the more text you have, the less fun you can have with it. <laughs> <coughs> So if you've got a title or a call out that's got two or three words, you can have a little bit of fun. If you are talking full on sentences, no fun. You may not have fun. Think Ariel, Tahoma, Verdana, no fun in paragraphs. Got it? Okay. Now I use, you know, like the font here at the top for too funky. That's a little funky, but it's not enough words for it to matter. Okay. So watch out for too funky. Centered. 
centered text, centered paragraphs are harder to read for everybody, but especially for some people. If somebody already has a reading challenge, this is going to be more challenging for them to read. Now it's okay, um, I've never heard anything that, that there's an issue with centering things like headings or captions. So think paragraphs, if you're in multiple lines, be careful about centering. And then all caps. I'm working with a client where they love all caps. Like they have a table of contents at the beginning of each PowerPoint chapter and it's in all caps, all of it. And it's just hard to read for everybody. So nice, plain, boring font, normal sentence case, reasonable size. Diane? Yes. Is there anything in the WCAG about serif or sans serif fonts? Good question. So, um, since <laughs> sans serif would be something like Arial or Tahoma, um, serif would be something like Times New Roman, where you've got the little feet at the top of like an L or the bottom of an N. Um, there used to be guidelines that said that in print, uh, serif was better and electronically sans serif was better, but that's when um, monitors were much, much lower resolution. Text is crisp enough these days that it really doesn't matter a whole lot. So, oh, industry standard is all caps. Make them change their mind. Be the change you want to see in the world. Yes. Okay. Number eight, one thing you can do starting tomorrow is to learn more, is to realize that this is a journey. One of the quickest things you can do is to change your social media algorithm. Social media, LinkedIn is my social media of choice. If you start liking and commenting things on a certain topic, you will get more of it. Go out, start, you know, sign up for hashtag accessibility. Uh, follow me. Um, follow a woman named Meryl Evans. She was, um, so one of you mentioned the If You Ask Betty podcast series I did. Go follow everybody who's on that one. And then when you see a post on accessibility, like it or comment it. Guess what? LinkedIn is, LinkedIn is going to give you more of it. More people to follow. That's one little thing that you can do to start learning more. Now, another thing that you can do to learn more is <coughs> I have created a resource page that is a hodgepodge of all the, the resources that I love. Um, and I'll be super honest, many of them I created myself. <laughs> so there's some self-love here. It's a hodgepodge though. This is not like a beautifully curated, curated course. Um, <clears throat> but it talks uh, like why accessibility matters. If you liked some of that stuff I talked about at the beginning, there's a full hour webinar on that topic. Um, the, the, the color contrast that I showed you, here's a short video that goes into uh, similar detail on that. Use Captivate, there's a webinar I did on that. So um, there's a lot of resources here that you can access. Let me put the um, link directly in chat for you. How long do you have access? I'm going to say you will have access for a minimum of 90 days. At 90 days, I don't plan to take it down, but I say 90 days because I don't want to be committed to stay in business forever or to use that web server forever. So after 90 days, I have the right for it to not be there anymore, but it could be there for years. So get out there and learn more. Learn about the WCAG standards. Learn about some of the details. Um, and hopefully these resources will help you um, get started down that road. And if you tackle your backlog, great. But even if you don't, even if you never tackle your backlog and all you did is focus on moving forward, you're making a difference. You are removing barriers for people. So we wanna make sure that we, um, <clears throat> that we are realistic about what we can accomplish and still always try and march forward. So here is a summary of the eight things you can do tomorrow. Use good color contrast, add closed captions, make bigger buttons, stop using sun space language, allow enough time, use inclusive imagery, make text readable, 
and learn more. So <clears throat> we um, have time left. So we did this on purpose to allow time for um, questions. And I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to pull up examples um, uh, where I can. Yes, and number nine, thank you. Let your learners know about the keyboard shortcuts already built into the software. Yes, love it. So um, let me uh, field questions. I'm going to leave the list up in case I want to screen, screen share something to answer one of your questions. Sure. I see Abby. Okay. We have Abby. Um, okay. So as far as understanding um, some of the storyline uh, ways in which we can engage learners, there's some talk from what I understand about how certain features um, are not accessible. Um, for example, um, dragging and dropping, or um, sometimes like, I was thinking about the hotspots, sometimes they're like really too small to click on and it's hard to expand them. Um, I guess from your experience, or can you share a little bit about uh, the do's and don'ts? Because I know that you've referenced Storyline quite a bit for mm -hmm. Storyline in particular. Yeah, certainly. So in most software, drag and drop questions are not accessible because it involves vision and it involves a mouse. So therefore, uh, we've stripped out all the fun and all, you know, right? <clears throat> That's what a lot of people think. Let me, um, if you can bear with me for just a minute, let me find um, an example that I, where I have a before and after of a, of a non-accessible version and an accessible version. If you bear with me for just a second, and I will find it. Maybe I won't find it fast enough. Hang on. No, that's a that's a good point though too. Is like, how do you make those things accessible? Yeah, that they're not. Yeah, I appreciate that. Right. So while I'm looking, let me put it on the screen so I can at least look at you while I'm looking for this. So one of the things that is helpful to um, to remember is to focus on what you can do instead of what you can't do. I have had new. Um, developers and writers work for us who've never done accessible before and they just they just shut down they're like oh i can't do these colors and i can't do a drag and drop and all of a sudden all of the creativity leeches from their body and you know they a lot of people think you can't use audio or you can't use video you can do all of those things you cannot do a drag and drop in most tools but how many things in your life have you learned without dragging and dropping anything? I mean, like, is that the hill we're going to die on? Is that worth inequality? Really? Are they that important? But we can still be creative. There's nothing accessible or inaccessible about a great story. There's nothing accessible or inaccessible about a great helpful scenario. You know, I can do branching, I can do all kinds of stuff, but no, I can't have them drag something. Okay. Well, if that's the only way I can make something interesting, shame on me, right? It's a crutch. Okay, so there's my little, I'm getting a little soapboxy again here. So I'm almost to where I want to be. I think it is this PowerPoint right here. Uh, let me, do I have the before and after? Uh, this one only has the before. Um, I don't want to make you keep looking. Okay, so this, is from a course that I did years ago. It's award-winning, it's on my portfolio, and now it makes me cringe. First of all, color contrast. Like seriously, Diane? That would, but that would be easy to fix. So the way this works is the B comes in, you decide which one it is, you drag it to the right one, you find you get it the right job. It's 10 points possible, and it counts down the longer. So, you know, like bar trivia, the longer it takes you to answer the question, the fewer points you get. So time-based element. So you've got color contrast, bam, exclusionary. Drag and drop, exclusionary. Countdown timer, the longer it takes you to either <laughs> mechanically do this course or, or process the information. Now, the reason I did the um, countdown timer was it was like that air traffic control. If I'm talking to you and I don't know me versus I, like, you got to make that decision. In fact, the, the title of this series is called Grammar at the Speed of Thought. Right? So does that mean I can't have any fun? Well, making these colors a little bit darker, no big deal. That is not gonna be a hard thing to do. Um, <clears throat> I could do something where I turn off 
the um, timer feature. It could be a preference at the very beginning. You want to play in timer mode or not play in timer mode? It's a game. Why would I exclude people just because of that timer? And then all I'd have to do here is make, instead of them dragging the B, I make it so that they have to click on either me or I and the, the B moves. That's all I'd have to do. Is it any less fun? If my colors are a little darker, I give you the option to turn off the timer and you click on the me instead of dragging. Or if you can't use a mouse at all, you would tab and hit enter. So you don't have to, oh, 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 oh wait, I found it. Here it is. Hang on, let me get it on the other monitor. Here's the after. So the points stay at 10. This is worth 10, period. And now what you do is, is you um, either click it with a mouse or you press tab. And when you press tab, oh, this is the version where I don't press tab. Yeah, you, you, you click the button or you press tab and then enter and the B just goes to the area. Like you can work around drag and drop. Now in Articulate Rise, um, their drag and drop, their sorting activity, which is drag and drop is mostly accessible. There's still a few little problems with it. But basically, it's you. you it's the same concept. Is you they tab to the correct answer and press enter, and the item moves. So they're they're close to their drag and drop being accessible. Okay. Good. What else? Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. Good. Other questions. What are some? Oh, oh I see. Um, I see the hand from Susan. <laughs> Hi, Diane. Thank you so much. This has been so informative. I'm wondering, how do you, when you get approached by a potential client to do e-learning and you want to make it accessible, how do you build in enough time for the development of making it as accessible as possible? I, that's where I'm lost. I don't know how much time to build into my proposals. So I know it could eat up everything, right? Well, not everything, but it does, it does well, take more time. Part of it is um, uh, baking it in from the beginning. It will take you much longer to retrofit a course to be accessible right. than to do it as you go. So I would personally guess, assuming you're knowledgeable, trained, educated, like you know what you're doing. So not your first project where you're still figuring out what's what. But right. if you know what you're doing, um, I would say that making something fully accessible, separate from formal testing, maybe an extra 15% effort. Okay. When you look at the whole course, I mean, from the instructional design to the writing, yeah. to the building, to the testing. Now, if um, going through the testing, like testing everything with a screen reader, um, if the client has a tester and then you have to work through them with them to remediate any of the issues that they found, if you have a PDF that you're attaching, that also has to be made accessible. So you can add up to where perhaps you know all said it could be maybe an extra twenty percent. Okay. And yeah. if you're if you're brand new, like I I, I did de uh, captivate e-learning three years ago, and I've been out of it for so long. I've been doing facilitation and stuff since. And if I want to get back into it, I'm hearing you talk a lot about Storyline. I don't know Storyline. I have to get back up into some of these products. Mm -hmm. How do I, and I know I have to eat that cost, but how do I, how do I make sure that I, if I say to the, the client, okay, I will get this done for you by X time. How do I know I'm giving myself enough time even? To get it done? <laughs> like forget about the billing, but I just want to deliver. <laughs> um, I personally, I believe that um, Storyline is quicker to work in than Captivate. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so whatever your Captivate numbers are, start there. Cause you know, you're going to not be fast at first. But I, I, I find it to be much, much faster. Um, let me send you, put in chat here, a link for anybody who's storyline curious. So back when, the, um, back when the pandemic first happened and so many people were having to pivot so quickly, um, I did a webinar with a coworker called The Least You Need to Know About Storyline. Mm -hmm. So it, it's free, it's two hours, it's a couple years old. I'll put the link here in chat for you. So if you Thank just you. like the minimum, 
Like I'm going to make a few slides. I'm going to make a simple click to reveal. I'm going to add a multiple choice and I'm going to publish. Like that's yeah. like the least you need to know. So I will put that in chat for you right now if you are storyline curious. But please don't think that that is all you can do in storyline. Okay. Uh, Storyline, <laughs> according according to e-learning or according to Learning Guild Research, their last authoring tools report came out in the fall of 2020. Storyline right. by far had the biggest market share, something around 69 percent in, oh. in a survey where people could select multiple tools. Captivate came in around 25, something like a big big difference. If you're okay. going to get, I'm sorry for going off topic, but sometimes I can't help myself. If you're going to hitch your uh, hitch to a star, don't hitch to a, to Captivate right now. They are doing a massive revamp. It's called Project Charm. They've been teasing it for over a year, saying it's almost in public beta. It's been a year and a half. It's still not in public beta. So I don't know when it's coming out, but it's yeah. from what I've seen, there's been some sneak peeks. It's completely revamped interface. So oh, I personally would be hesitant if I had to relearn software to go relearn Captivate now, because you might have to relearn it all again in three months or six months. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Um, and the current version of Captivate um, is pretty wonky in terms of accessibility. And I do not know if they have prioritized accessibility in the new version. I have not seen it one way or the other, but they've got a pretty big government client base. So I'd be surprised if they didn't prioritize it in their new version. Yeah. Great. There's a nice comment in there from Abby Susan about Yukon Learning. Mm -hmm. and Thank then, you, Abby. And then also, I would suggest that you hook up with eLearning Heroes because they do those challenges. Mm -hmm. and those challenges will reawaken skills, even if you were a Captivate user. So okay. those skills that you have developed using Captivate, a lot of those are transferable. Mm -hmm. Just the use of your imagination and creativity. Mm -hmm. so then you can practice the skills that Diane has brought to us today, you know, and, and ask the community for further assistance. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would be curious, Diane, as to what other common interactions do you see in e-learning programs other than perhaps the drag and drop that, you know, we use all the time, but we don't really think about them as being, you know, barriers for people? Yeah. Um, uh, anything that involves um, interpreting an image is challenging. So one of the things that we use a lot is what's wrong with this picture? Uh, wow. meaning what's wrong with this person's personal protective gear? What's wrong with this email? What's wrong with this office setup for information security violations? Where you're asking them to scan this image and find problems. Now, I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm saying you have to do it very thoughtfully. So one of the things we have not talked about is alt text, um, because I was going for things that you can do quickly and alt text takes some, some time. So what is alt text? Well, let me go to, um, let me pull up my, one of my storyline courses. So if I have, and this is a non-example, by the way, my color contrast issues. Um, if I, have, if I can't see it, I'm using a screen reader. The screen reader is auto, automatically going to read any text to me. But this image, a screen reader is not AI. Screen reader does not know what that image is. And so as the developer, I'm going to put in a description of it. And that description is going to be what the screen reader picks up. So I have to put a lot of thought into what, I, uh, what I'm going to put as that alt text. So if I have a what's wrong with this um, picture scenario, I have to decide how I'm going to describe that picture. And it can be challenging. So let's say it's an information, actually, you know what, um, if you'll bear with me for just a second, I have an example I can pull up. One moment, please. Uh, this is from my Storyline Accessibility course. This is it. This is it. Yep, here we go. So here we have a, let me zoom in. This is a what's wrong with this uniform 
scenario. It's from a very old course, and so the picture is awful and grainy now. It's my stepdaughter, Allie. She's like 35 now. Um, and so if I, if I just have a click on the five issues, then I'm, I'm assuming you can see the image. So instead, I have put the little hot spots around it. I have to decide what to say about it. And that can be tricky because, for example, her shirt is dirty. So if I just put alt text that says dirty shirt and all you hear is dirty shirt, kind of gives away the answer. Whereas if you were using your eyes, you may or may not notice that. And so it's a, it's a bigger look. Some of that's just going to happen. Like, I can't think of a way to write around that. A white shirt with a strange gray area. Like, I don't think that's going to be clear. So I think that one's is going to be a bit of a gimme. But even things like, um, like the name tag. <clears throat> I could say non-compliant name tag. Well, no, that's bad alt text because I'm unnecessarily giving away the answer. But instead, I, could, I, can make, I can phrase it just like phrasing any good distractor. You don't want it to be super obvious. So I could say um, personalized name tag um, with a, our handwritten name tag with some embellishments. And so if the teaching point is, nope, only use your, your standard issue, well, you still have to remember that that's what it is, but I haven't come out and said non-compliant. You know, I can say large hoop earrings and either, you know, yeah, I'm calling it out because visually you might forget to check for earrings. The fact that there's alt text about the earrings kind of gives it away. So then the other thing you might want to do in a case like this is put in true distractors. So I should call out something that's allowed because if everything I call out is a mistake, well, I'm giving you away the answer. So why don't I flag a few things that are okay? Now, granted in this, oh, like rings or nail polish, those are both allowed. Well, if you are using your eyes, you're probably looking at the hands and going, yep, that's fine, that's fine. You, you considered those rings and you considered that nail polish with your eyes. So let somebody do it through a screen reader as well. So can you do visual activities? Yeah, but you have to be really, really thoughtful about it. I'd also be careful about a matching activity that has too many choices. Because if you're doing, a, let's say I have 10 states and 10 state capitals, and you're using your eyes, you're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth trying to make your decisions. If you're using a screen reader, you're having to put all of those in working memory. Like I can't process 10 on one side and 10 on the other and try, like it just would be really hard. So I personally try not to do matching activities with more than about five or six items. And in Storyline, you would need to use the drop down version, not the drag and drop version of matching. And um, uh, Taz is asking, can you use hotspots and have alt text? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, what you might have to do, oh, I'm trying to remember now, for a long time, hotspot couldn't have alt text. And so you would have to use a transparent shape and treat it like a, a, a hotspot. Yeah, that's just, how, I was curious how, like if you were targeting those items on the image, Yep. How, um, how you were getting them to tab through it. Yep, yep. And just like I would with the, with the um, person using a mouse is I'd have to put a hotspot over them, whether it's the official hotspot or a transparent shape. Or a transparent shape, okay, cool. <clears throat> Good, other questions? Um, as far as your own personal journey and understanding accessibility for instructional design and learning and development, um, what was kind of like your aha moment? Great question. I think one of my biggest aha moments was when I sat down next to a woman who uses a screen reader in her real life and watched her take one of my courses. And then anytime I have a chance to observe somebody test my work. So that was a case early in my journey where we hired somebody. We made a course that we believed was accessible because we studied all the things you're supposed to study. And then we paid a woman who is blind to take the course and I watched her take the course. And the first thing I did um, on the course is we had some accessibility preferences. And we were very proud of them. She flew right through them. Like, what, why didn't you turn on the accessibility preferences? She, I didn't know what, I didn't know what they um, did. And I didn't want to cede control. 
So I've changed my language. So it's about learn about accessibility preferences so that they know all they're doing when they click that link is to go learn about them and not actively enable them. Um, a number of our clients have gone through formal testing and sometimes the testers use assistive technology in their own lives. And anytime I get feedback from someone who uses that technology in their life is really helpful. Things like adding alt text to a close button. Let's say you have a click to reveal activity and you have a close button for everything you pop up. And I was watching this person and he was really good at narrating what he was thinking at any time. And he goes, close what? And a close button. Close what? Well, I know it means close the layer. If you can see, you can tell it means close the layer. He doesn't know whether it meant close the course, close the browser. Like, I never would have guessed because I don't live that life. So I always learn something when I interact with somebody who's going to be impacted by the choices I make. And if you don't know anybody who can do some testing for you, most universities have an accessibility office and you can probably um, find somebody there that you can hire to do a little testing for you and give you some feedback. I think that's great advice for development in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't you? It yeah. Make, make things bigger, make things shorter, make things clearer, you know, uh, design with the human in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most things that you do for accessibility will benefit all learners. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just, just like a, a mindset, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Shannon, you and I were talking that before everybody else came in. It's um, often called the curb cut effect. So back in the day, um, the accessibility community lobbied for sidewalks to have those cutouts at the corners so that wheelchairs could, um, could go up sidewalks. But it's good for people with strollers and it's good for people with luggage. And it's the, you know, the number of people who use closed captions on TV shows who are not deaf or hard of hearing is very high. And if you've ever watched Broadchurch and tried to watch it without closed captions, you have no idea what that lieutenant says. I mean, my gosh, it's impossible. So yeah, everybody can benefit when we make our courses clearer and easier to use and easier to understand. Okay, well, my closing thought, oh, another question? I, I don't know if we have enough time. My question was going to be around the business case. Um, so when we are attempting to move the needle and um, when it has to become an actual conversation with a client or um, proving to a decision maker that, again, it's the right thing to do. And even if it does necessarily add on a little bit of time, if we're baking it into the beginning, right, we're, we're, we're changing our standard of how we go about doing things from the beginning. Do you have any thoughts or advice on ways that we could have this type of conversation where we're not uh, where we're trying to meet our stakeholder or decision maker where they're at? So we're using their language and we're trying to indicate to them you know, the, the business case for, for doing this. Great. One thing to do is don't ask a question that you don't want the answer to. Don't, don't ask a question that's easy for them to reject. So if I were to say, hey, can we make our courses fully WCAG compliant? That is an easy question to say no to. So don't ask that question. Instead, ask the question of, um, I want to make sure that everybody, regardless of their ability, has the opportunity to get better at their job. So um, can you help me work through some ways to make sure that we're fully equitable in our professional development opportunities? Like, that's a question you can't just easily say no to. That doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get what you need, but phrase it in terms of of course you want this. How can you not want this? You'd be a monster if you didn't want this. Um, and also frame it up as part of what are probably larger DEI conversations you're having in your organization. Make sure ability has a seat at that table. So you can tie into that, say, I know we've got a lot of initiatives around DEI. And one of the things I wanna make sure is that we have an equitable professional development um, environment. 
I want to make sure that everybody here has an equal opportunity to get better at their jobs. And we said, <laughs> some time to go over what I'll be implementing. Mm -hmm. So that's also called the assumptive close. I'm, I'm using language assuming the answer is yes. Yes. Now, there are different ways, you know, in terms of do they have to. So um, in the U.S., Section 508 of the Workforce Rehabilitation Act says that government agencies must do this. There's no official formal super de duper law that says private organizations do. However, it does fall under Americans with Disabilities Act in that you're not allowed to discriminate. And if everybody else gets to get better at their job and you don't, um, how is that not discrimination? However, ADA does allow for reasonable accommodation. So some would argue, well, if somebody has a disability and can't take the course, they can come to us and we'll figure something out. Doesn't really feel equitable to me. Um, <coughs> there is case law that is gradually making it more and more of a requirement. There was recently a Department of Justice um, paper <laughs> ruling, <laughs> I don't know, not quite a law, but official, that finally said that if you're, um, if you're a public accommodation business like a pizza store, it was a Domino's case, um, if your store has to be ADA accessible, then your website does as well. That had never been formal doctrine, and now it is formal doctrine as of about six months ago, that you must. But that's for places where you have to, where you, they need to allow you in physically. So the tide is shifting, and it's going to happen. It is only a matter of time before there's formal case law or formal Department of Justice or Dar Department of Labor guidance. If you're in... <laughs> Higher, uh, if you're in um, state, many states have their own requirements. If you're state government, I know California has um, even a teeny bit more strict than federal. Um, and uh, university, uh, higher ed, and actually any K through 12 or higher ed has their own laws as well. I think, it, I think it's a little bit more cut and dry with universities as well that, that some of it's required. Corporate, there's still a little bit of a wiggle room. Just ask a question that doesn't emphasize the need. Well, I will leave you with a sobering thought. All ability is temporary. And so even if you don't have anybody in a job or anybody that you know of that has a, a disability today, that doesn't mean they won't tomorrow. And are you really going to kick out some of your most experienced folks because now they have carpal tunnel and can't use a mouse anymore? Bye bye. I don't need your 20 years experience anymore. I don't need your perspective anymore. I don't want you on my team anymore. So all ability is temporary. So let's be careful about the assumptions that we're making in all of our design choices. <coughs> Shannon, back to you. Great. Well, thank you for that, Diane. That was <coughs> very informative and enlightening. I, it just, it, like we talked before we, we went live, it's the work that I was doing to set up for this particular Learn Something New Wednesday just enlightened me so much more than I thought I was. I thought I was pretty enlightened, you know, but as you start digging into the layers and the possibilities and the fact that it's, you know, when you all is said and done, it's difficult, but not hard. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I love that these eight tips that I wrote down, I mean, they're truly, they're, they are things that I can do. And thank you for, you know, going to my website. <laughs> so there are things that I can do now to make changes, you know, even for my own, you know, customer mm -hmm. base, if it were, you know, yeah. so I appreciate that. And I appreciate mm -hmm. your time today. And, you know, especially with you not feeling a hundred percent, thank you. Thank you for that. You know, again, yeah. uh, generous of, of nature and soul. So thank you. And thank for, the you rest so much. Of you, for the rest of you, thank you for being here. I hope that you found this to be informative and, and valuable for your time. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.